Good afternoon, everyone. As advertised, I'm David Terrell, Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering and Provost at Caltech. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's celebration of our friend and colleague, Rudy Marcus, on the occasion of his 100th birthday. Many of you have known Rudy far longer than I have, and I'm sure that most of you know that today really is his birthday. There are many reasons for us to be grateful for the opportunity to share in today's celebration. Among them, the rarity of events of this kind. 100th birthdays are rare enough, but among Nobel laureates, there have been just seven. I would have said that Rudy's modesty and cheerful outlook have played critical roles in helping him reach this milestone. But then I noticed that Henry Kissinger had a similar celebration a few weeks ago. <laughs> I guess we have to look elsewhere. I first met Rudy in the summer of 1996, when he was a boy of 73, and I was starting to think about joining the Caltech faculty. I bring this up not because I think you were wondering when I first met Rudy but because I was so struck by our conversation at that time. Rudy's lively curiosity was apparent from the first minute of our conversation, as he asked me question after question about the most interesting current problems in polymer chemistry. It was my first exposure to Rudy's infectious interest in experimental chemical phenomena, which has always served as the starting point for his powerful theoretical work. As he says in his oral history, which is in the Caltech archives, and I would highly recommend it, one shouldn't just play mathematical games. One should do theory in the real world. Rudy's theory in the real world has had profound influence on the fields of chemistry, biology, and material science, extending from his classic papers on reaction rates in the 1950s and 60s to new studies of biological motors that continue to emerge from his research group seven decades later. The organizers of today's symposium have arranged a series of presentations that will give us a glimpse of Rudy's extraordinary scientific contributions and the impact that he's had on the lives and careers of so many of us in the chemical sciences. Welcome to all of you and congratulations to Rudy. Okay, so I'm Garnet Chan. I am a professor of chemistry uh, here, and I'm one of Rudy's junior colleagues, and my office is just down the hall from his. You know, we have a very uh, rich and varied program today with speakers from all uh, stages of, you know, of Rudy's, uh, Rudy's career. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Yiqing Gao, who is a Changjiang professor of chemistry uh, at Peking University. Uh, Yiqin very much wanted to be here, but had a last-minute visa issue and was not able to travel. Um, but he kindly uh, recorded his presentation from us, so we'll be hearing um, from his recording, uh, which we'll play now. Dear distinguished guests, I'm Yiqin Gao from Peking University. I'm honored to speak at this symposium to celebrate the 100th birthday of Professor Rudy Marcus. Congratulations, Rudy. As you can see, uh, here's a picture of Rudy on the top of the Great Wall of China in 2017. In China, people say one cannot be called a hero without reaching the Great Wall. At the age of 94, Rudy was not bragging of his climbing up to the Great Wall, but he was talking to me actually all the time about this molecule, which is called uh, FATPs, a protein motor. Rudy is so well known to the world for his contributions to theoretical chemistry, including R chem theory and electron transfer theory. But he is also very deeply interested in biological systems. Since the late 1970s, he became interested in FATPs, and I had the opportunity to work with him when I was postdoc, actually, on this subject. Up to today, 
really still publishing actively uh, in this field and makes great contributions. Inspired by Rudy's interest in biology, I also became very interested in biological systems. So during my independent research career, I became interested in how epigenetics, in particular chromatin, chromatin structures, help to shape the fate of cells. The chromatin structures were normally deduced from deep sequencing experiments, but these data are normally very noisy. So we have developed mathematical, mathematical tools not only to denoise, but to enhance the data, which allowed us to construct faithfully the chromatin structures. Such construction then give us pictures in which the chromatin structures of different cells are indeed different. For example, here we can see that the normal colon tissues and the colon cancers really have very different chromatin structures shown by this so-called high C contact map, but uh, reconstructed using our mathematical model. Our further analysis showed that this difference between normal tissues and the cancers are not only at the chromatin level, but also at the protein level. So in cancer cells, there are many wrong protein-protein interactions that are formed. But these protein-protein protein interactions actually are also very closely related or correlated to their coding gene interactions. Namely, those genes that tend to have wrong interactions in disease, their coded proteins also tend to interact wrongly in their cancer cells. Our collaborations with the experimental groups have largely confirmed uh, this observation. So in this sense, then uh, we, const uh, we have a theoretical tool to analyze based on the genomics and the epigenet uh, epigenetics, uh, how the uh, biological interaction networks are affected in the sense of chromatin structures. So based on these chromatin structures, as well as other epigenetic information, we can de deduce the disease-related and the disease-specific protein-protein interactions. Therefore, they can serve as potential therapeutic targets. But for them to become real therapeutic targets, we need their structures. We need the structures of either the proteins or the protein-protein complexes. Inspired by the success of AlphaFood 2 and following their strategies, we trained AI models for protein structure prediction starting from protein sequence. But different from the AlphaFood model, which relies on the so-called multi-sequence alignment to get evolutionary information, we developed so-called protein sequence generative models. And therefore, our requirement for the sequence uh, depth is much lower, and we are able to predict structures more precisely or more accurately than the uh, original AlphaFold uh, 2 uh, model, as shown by, by the red data here. In addition to being more accurate, because we now do not need to search the databases for the sequence alignment, uh, our model now reduces the computational time uh, greatly. In AlphaFold 2, actually, one needs typically thousands of seconds to do the structure inference. But using our model, it requires only dozens of seconds. Our model has been shown to be effective uh, in the computation uh, of protein structure uh, prediction internationally. So our model uh, typically rank pretty high in this competition. Besides protein structure prediction, uh, we also developed models, AI models, for protein ligand structure prediction. Uh, for example, compared to uh, the docking program of Vena, uh, we can speed up uh, by uh, dozens of times or a few hundred of times, depending on whether it's a rigid blind docking or flexible blind docking. We are not only faster, but also the accuracy uh, has been improved as well. 
we have implemented all these methods and programs in the same AI-based platform. In that platform, one can perform AI-based protein structure prediction. One can also do fast molecular screening and docking, as well as traditional molecular dynamic simulations. It can also be used to generate molecules based on the physical requirement, for example, based on the structure of the targets. We have published and open sourced some of the computer codes in different publications, including one that is on traditional molecular dynamic simulations, and the other one on AI-based molecular modeling, which was recently published in JCTC. Much of the methodology development and computer coding were done by a group of talented students and co-workers. But none of them would have been possible without your inspiration and encouragement, really. You have taught me everything in theoretical chemistry since I was a graduate student and then a postdoc at Caltech. You not only shaped my scientific career, but also shaped my scientific tastes. You also touched positively almost every aspect of my life. You and your family have treated myself and my family as your own. I also want to thank Mitchell, Garnett, Margarita, and many others for putting together this wonderful symposium to celebrate Rudy's birthday. My wife and I are really sorry that we are not able to come physically to celebrate this great moment. We have a been planning on this for a long time, actually. But the world has really observed a hundred years of excellence of Rudy, and many more will come and to celebrate. Congratulations again, Rudy and family. So it's really a shame uh, Professor Gao couldn't be here, but I just wanted to point out uh, his son, Andrew. So Andrew, you want to stand up? Okay. Um, okay, so um, our, um, of course there are no questions for you, Jin, um, but um, our next speaker is uh, Stephen Klippenstein from Los Alamos. So Stephen, oh, there you are. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so, um, so Stephen is the uh, Argonne Distinguished Fellow in Theoretical Chemistry at, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I said Los Alamos, at, at Argonne National Lab. Um, he'll be telling us about adventures in RRKM theory. Um, and in addition, he'll be presenting some slides also from another of uh, Rudy's uh, longtime friends and collaborators, uh, Jonathan Connor. It's a, it's a great honor and, and privilege, first to have studied with Rudy for all those years, and, and, and uh, we all know what a f kind of a fantastic example he sets for all of us, and, and, and then to come and, and celebrate here with, with him today. Th thank you, Michio and, and Garnett and, and Margarita for, for organizing this all. It, it really has been, it really does, is a lot of fun to be here. Um, we all know what a, what, a, what a you know classic example of a generally scholar who has Terrell told us how, you know how uh, how he's just always happy and, and and that's just the reality of every day you know he, I, I don't think I ever saw him unhappy I don't think I ever saw him utter a harsh word to me or to anyone lots of chances to utter harsh words to people like me I, I was extremely naive I, I still am naive I, I'm the master at naivety and I'll give you some examples of that for, for the, the right now one good example is. When I first started working with Rudy, I um, worked on electron transfer. Probably most of you don't know that. I, I did my first couple of projects on electron transfer theory. After about a year or two of that, I came to, to Rudy and I said, you know, I really don't think there's any future in electron transfer theory. <laughs> 
I want to work in dynamics. And so I've spent the rest of my career trying to make up for that grand faux pas and trying to show, show the world that really he should be getting his second Nobel Prize in RRKM theory, right? What, what other theory beyond, beyond RRKM theory is that has been used as widely as it has and has been validated so extensively with experiments? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, about some of that validation that, we, that happened during my time with, with Rudy. Before I do that, one more quick example of my naivety. When I first came here, Rudy gave me a project to work on. I mean, he, he's tremendous with his freedom, and that was why, why I went, when I came to this, he said, okay, go ahead and work in chemical dynamics. But I, I did my first project on him. He gave me some, I calculated something, and it all came, turned out fine. I was so neat, I didn't know what you did do, do next. So I did nothing. And then a, a year or two later, Rudy comes to me with this paper and, and shows it to me. Doesn't say anything, just uh, here's an interesting paper, he says. What's the paper? Just somebody writing up exactly what I had done as a calculation for, for him, but, but I didn't publish it because I didn't know, I didn't know that was what you did as a part of the research. And, <laughs> anyways, I, I can give you hundreds of examples of my naivety, but that's not what we're here for today. We're to, here to celebrate Rudy. And so what, 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 did, what did we do? What, what, is the, what, what have, have I been working on that sort of continues some of that? Our chem theory. We all know what our chem theory is, right? It's, it's the classic theory for, for unimolecular reactions. I had the great privilege a year ago of giving the Spears Memorial Lecture where, at, at, at a Faraday meeting, and it was great fun, basically emphasizing how our chem theory is really the foundation of everything still. After you know, 70 years, it's still the foundation of everything that we think about in, in gas phase chemical dynamics. And, and people think of our chem theory as, as this equation, you know, the statistical equation for, for the decomposition at an energy result. Much more of it, too, is that we, he dealt with the pressure dependence. And yeah, we've got a little bit beyond in the pressure dependence and thinking about collisions up and down and, and not just single collisions and defining it. But the basic framework is still all there. When I was a graduate student, I had the great fortune. I mean, how many people can say this? One of their, their first 10 papers was with two Nobel Prize winners. And what, what happened was Zueo was, in, it was, was just in the midst of, of, of doing some really nice leading work on, on nanosecond, picosecond level uh, dissociation rate measurements. And, and he looked first at NCNO, and then he looked at ketene. And NCNO, I was pounding around this problem, trying to figure out, my job was to try and find a, a, a theoretical approach that would agree with his experimental data, the plus signs. I couldn't get it to work. And then Rudy goes to a meeting in, in, in England, and I guess he was trying to present some of this, and he looked at, looked at it. Of course, he instantly figured out what I was being dumb about. And he calls me and says, well, you know, you need to think somewhat differently about electronic states. Same day, I knew what my problem had been, that I've been stumbling on for months and months. And we, we got this nice agreement with, Rudy, with Ackman's data. The next problem was ketene, and, and here we had, again, nice experimental data from Zoeil but also from Brad Moore Group. In this case, we're, we're, by this time, I, um, I knew a little bit more about electronic states, but also the experiments, we were able to separate out singlet and triplet states, and we were able to, again, get really nice agreement with experimental data. And, and, and to do that, one of the things we had to start thinking about was a two-transition state model. A two-transition state model really first came about from Bowers and, and Chesnovich, and, and we adapted that for, for neutrals, and with that adaptation, with, with Rudy's guidance, we were able to explain uh, Brad Moore's, what he calls FOFEX spectra, absolutely quantitatively, and that, that was a really, really big step forward. Um, this was all done with very empirical potentials. At, up to that point, I didn't know anything about electronic structure. I was afraid of Bill. I didn't attend his class because I would, I, would, I, would, I would get tortured or something. <laughs> I thought, I don't know what my problem was, but anyways. We want, you know, it's nice to have empirical potentials that agree with, but then, then we, 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 um, we wanted to try and get beyond that. And so I started collaborating with others as I moved off on my own as a, as a, as a starting professor. And I worked with Wes Allen, who was from Fritz Schaefer's group, doing some of these same kind of things that, that Bill Goddard teaches us, us all in, in, in quantum chemistry classes. And we were able to show that even if we put in real potentials, we could still get that same quantitative agreement. And since that time, there's been almost no measures of microcanonical rate constants. 
Everybody in the laser world moved towards doing femtosecond chemistry, which is all well and good. It's not really chemistry from my perspective, though, because it's, it's, it's not what happens on the ground state most often. You try and do femtosecond chemistry, you try to look at things that happen very fast, so you've got to be on a repulsive state, not a ground state. Very recently, I've had the fortune of collaborating with Marsha Lester, who's now doing similar kinds of experiments, but with really exciting new kinds of species, Kriegi intermediates. I don't know if anybody knows what Kriegi intermediates, but they're very unstable. They react with everything and basically really fast. QOH, while the standard procedure for getting radical oxidation involves a succession of, of, of an O2 addition, then an H transfer to make what we call a QOH, and then a second O2 to get chain branching. So this is the key species in chain branching, in combustion, in atmospheric chemistry, everywhere. And she, she's found a way to, 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 to synthesize these in situ in, a, in an expansion and by that do IR pump UV probe action spectroscopy and get observations of rate constants for a range of energies. And this brings us to, to another thing. One of the, as, as, as Professor Terrell said, it's always the connection to experiment. That's one of the things he really ingrained on us. The other thing that he ingrained, uh, that, that he just set by example, not ingraining, is you really should work hard. If you want to do something good, it's good. Look, look, I didn't get where I got by, by, by being lazy. He got where he got by, by, by being really hardworking. But anyway, so, so connecting to experiments. So we, we teamed up with, with Marsha Lester, and she has these beautiful measurements. And we go ahead and do our very best calculation. By this point, I'm actually a reasonably decent quantum chemist. I've, I've learned to, to some of the things that, that Bill could have taught me much easier, much more easily. And we do really high-level electronic structure calculation. And now, without any variable variation of parameters, we're getting quantitative agreement with experiment. It's nice to get agreement, but you're supposed to learn things, not just show you can agree. One of the things you learn here is this Dash, this gray line is with um, no tunneling. Blue line is with tunneling. The reaction coordinate is an O atom moving like this and the OH moving off. All heavy atom motion. Yet you see almost an order of magnitude tunneling effect near the threshold. Quite a remarkable effect, in my opinion. We don't want to do just energy resolve. We want to connect to real world problems. The atmospheric chemistry is really important these days. We better understand what we're doing to our climate pretty soon or we're in big trouble. So here's one, con so to connect to that, you have to convert to thermal rates. We show here, we can, we can do that thermal rate connection as well. That's, that's what she has observed for QOH. For, for a Kriegi intermediate, uh, tunneling, she gets to, she's been a, managed to observe them down to a few thousand wave numbers below the threshold. And again, we're able to get quantitative agreement with her experiments. The last thing we're doing is kind of like a continuation of what we first learned with, with Rudy again. It's not just two transition states that matter. We, we often talk now about what we call roaming reactions. What is a roaming reaction? You, you sort of partially break a bond, and then you say, oh, while we're, far, while we're partially broken, why don't our two things move around and then do some reaction on some other side of the molecule? All right? And so how do you treat that? You have a transition state for breaking the bond, a transition state for moving around, a transition state for reattaching, transition state for going out to infinite separation. You put all those pieces together, and you can get quantitative descriptions. And it's just like putting multiple RRKM models and stitching them together. We do that, we can find all sorts of interesting things. And, and for this particular system here, I'm not sure we, we, we're able to get agreement between theory and experiment again. So let, let me just conclude this part of my talk by saying thank you, Rudy, for providing me with just an absolutely outstanding example of what it is to be a, a leading and well-respected scientist. I, I really appreciate the model that, that, that you gave for us. Your, your singular drive to understand the microscopic world really helped motivate my own efforts throughout the year. And I, and I, and I, I really do think we should, we should all appreciate that example he has set for all of us. Um, Jonathan Connor was a postdoc with Rudy. He can't be here. So I, I'm, I'm now switching gears going to his part of the time. He wanted somebody to present, and I think Margarita and him volunteered me, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say some words. He also is, is highly appreciated. I actually met Jonathan for the first time last year. He had been at Caltech, and he must have left like a week before I arrived or something uh, when he came as a, a sabbatical visitor. I'd also like to say a few words now just before I start this, though. Yuri Georgievsky was, was another 
postdoc of Rudy's. Yuri's become my senior researcher, so I consider him a gift from Rudy because he's been just a fantastic member of my team throughout the years. He couldn't be here today. He wishes he could. He had a horrible motorcycle accident in January, and he's still recovering from that, and so, so couldn't come. But he sends you his regards, Rudy. Back to Jonathan Connor. He was at the University of Illinois with Rudy as a postdoc in 69 to 71, and then at Caltech as a visiting associate. And he wants us to tell us a little bit about some of the, the papers he had. He says they're all good. Nobody, nobody said they're wrong yet. And we know we all love to tell people when they're wrong, so they must, have been, they must be pretty good. All right. He had a paper on collinear reactive scattering. And that, that paper simplified the theoretical treatment of the boundary condition. One of the great, great strengths of Rudy's is he can go from really deep theoretical, mathematical studies directly to really important physical observations, all right? And so here he's, 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 he's doing some of that deep mathematical transformations, working in semi-classical theory. And one of, one of the fun things about this is, I see Bill Miller's here, him, Bill and, and Rudy had some competition going on at this, this time for, for, for thinking about, about different aspects of semi-classical mechanics. So in this particular paper, he's looking at what is a conformational transition, transformation. And he says it simplifies the, the analysis of boundary conditions. I guess if you're doing some kind of numerical analysis and you've got uh, odd shapes like this, it's probably hard to get good grids and things in your, in your analysis. People after him took it up and, 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 and went ahead and did numerical thing, simulations and, and it seemed to be useful, although it means that you had to have an analytic function. Here's, here's Jonathan going back in his ancient history, finding that he's got old identifications from, to prove that he really was a graduate student with Rudy from a long time ago. All right. He had another paper on 3D semi-classical, elastic, inelastic, and reactive collisions. Theory of semi-classical transition probabilities for inelastic and reactive collisions. Another mathematical development. The main result was, it was the, the, the importance of, of area approximations. And, and, and John then says it's used now all the time, these area approximations in various areas. He's had a, a recent application in, 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 in um, looking at glories, hidden rainbows, and, and scattering for, for uh, H plus HD reactions. A couple of different papers he's published now just in the last year or two. And Jonathan points out that one of his papers with, with Rudy when he was a graduate student is, is now considered a citation classic. He claims that any paper with more than 100 citations is a, is a citation classic. Well, if all of us people that learn from Rudy were to, to, to add up our citation classics, I know we would have at least hundreds, maybe thousands of citation classics. What does that say but that Rudy had to have really set a fantastic example? How to, how to work hard, how to pick meaningful projects to work on so that they become important and, 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 and solve them well. Jonathan moves on to his 1983 paper. This is a lengthy paper. I mean, this is a, a paper that looks at solving the math equation. And this also has received a large number of citations, 58 citations. Another proof that he really was <laughs> working with you, Rudy. Jonathan had the privilege, the, the genius, to suggest, uh, I think I saw Mukamal here somewhere, to show that, 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 that we should have a special issue for him. And, and that turned out to be a really nice thing, and, and, and we should thank Shaul for, for, for getting that, that organized, yes. Another example of my naivety. That, this is during the time I was there. I had no idea really what this was. I, I don't have a paper in, in this issue, I don't think. Has really changed? Is this picture that somebody just took from now and put it on there? It sure kind of looks like it, doesn't it? <laughs> Anyways, Con Jonathan highlights the fact that, 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 that we should all read this personal view of Rudy's. Look at that. Here he's writing a, theory, a, a summary of his work, and he can't resist bringing up experiment because that really is how he thinks, and that's really how he trained us all to think. And that's why so many of his people have, have had so many citation classics. Jonathan, happy birthday to you, Rudy. 
Thank you for inspiring me and many others in our careers and in research. Okay, so um, let's now move to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Alexei Stushevrikov, who's a professor at the University of California, Davis. Um, Alexei will be telling us a story about electron transfer chains uh, in a glass of wine. Here's to you, Rudy. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a privilege to be here. It's really a pleasure. Rudy, dear Rudy, happy birthday. And I'm thrilled really uh, to be here today. So here's a bottle of wine <laughs> from our recent paper that I thought I would bring for this talk. Um, and it's Fenton, 1894. It's pretty old, over 100 really. <laughs> so the paper is on Fenton oxidation and uh, electron transfer in, in wine. I thought I would mention uh, this meeting today. But before that, some personal memories and stories, of course. So here we go. I was at Caltech with Rudy in 1994. And, uh, <laughs> boy, I'm thinking that. A marvelous time, uh, Rudy, and uh, one of my you know, best time in my scientific life. And just to tell you how it was for a theoretician, I have one favorite story to tell, OK? So back then, uh, Rudy and I worked on, on IVR, intramolecular vibrational relaxation. And one day, uh, a subject of, of curvilinear coordinates came up. And, and curvilinear coordinates, it's a quantum mechanics in curved space, and you need to calculate Jacobians. And Jacobians are determinants. So turns out that I knew one cute formula uh, from quantum field theory for a determinant. Okay, I'm not going to tell you which one, but if you ask me, I will. So I thought that I will use this cute formula in IVR from quantum field theory. So one evening I set up the calculations and then things turned out not as easy as I expected, of course. And I struggled the whole night through mistakes and everything. And some, and finally, finally, somewhere between four and five in the morning, I finally got it. It was so beautiful. It's just exactly what I expected. I, I was so excited I could not sleep anymore. And I needed to share with somebody. But how do you share? With whom do you share? Five o'clock in the morning. So what I did, uh, I went to a super, super, supermarket on Lake, uh, which was open 24-7, and bought a, bottle of wine, bought a bottle of champagne. Okay, I knew that Rudy would come at 8 o'clock in the morning, so by 8 I was by the door of this office uh, with a bottle of uh, champagne, and I told him about the results, and we had a wonderful conversation. And in the end, we celebrated the results with champagne. So celebrating results, 8 o'clock in the morning, with champagne and with Rudy. So that's how it was. <laughs> Rudy, thank you. All right, so the following up, follow up uh, trip to ACS in San Diego, Laura Marcus, my wife, uh, 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 here. So it was a family style uh, kind of uh, time. Many memorable trips to Acapulco restaurant for fried ice cream. So it was, it was great. So next came 92, memorable 92. And I remember one uh, morning uh, in October, and the very early, seven or even earlier, I was doing exercises in my apartment on Holliston, ready to go to my office. A telephone came from, California, from, from Caltech administration. Where is Rudy? So <laughs> I told him Rudy was in Canada at a conference. So, so I said, what's happening? So they said, you'll know soon. <laughs> <laughs> so soon correspondents from local media started calling my apartment in Holliston. And I had to explain the difference between RQM and Marcus Electron Transfer Theory. <laughs> so it was great. Uh, uh, Rudy was in Canada, and the uh, all Nobel Prize excitement uh, was channeled to the group. And I think that we did well, Rudy. <laughs> so, so this is later uh, that year. Rudy came back from, from Stockholm, and he explains here how to receive a Nobel Prize. Okay. And, I, and I assist him. <laughs> So here is on the stage, Rudy plays the king, <laughs> Carl Gustav. And I play Rudy. <laughs> 
in this box, there is a fake gold medal, uh, the copy of a real one <laughs> that Rudy kept in the drawer of his, of his desk. So, <laughs> so it was great. So Rudy, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, for all this time. Uh, and it, it was, was absolutely great. Uh, crucial for me, of course, not to mention that I got a job in it. <laughs> All right, now back to Fenton Bottle. Now, Fenton was a British chemist who, in 1894, uh, described what we now call Fenton oxidation, okay, and Fenton reagent. Fenton reagent is, is a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and uh, iron two salts. And in the mixture, this, uh, this, this mix produces hydroxyl radicals and then oxidizes anything that, that you want a solution. This is a very uh, uh, useful reaction, which, uh, which is used in uh, many areas of, of, uh, of, of chemical uh, uh, industry. But in biology, it plays absolutely a fundamental role. Uh, because, uh, uh, for example, human aging is related to that reaction. All right. So Fenton uh, invented this uh, reaction inadvertently by mixing tartaric acid, uh, iron two salt, and, and hydrogen uh, peroxide. All right. Now, at UC Davis, we have enology department, which is ranked, which is ranked uh, one, first or second in the world in winemaking. And two of my colleagues uh, there, uh, Bob Coleman and Roger Bolton, are making experiments on simple wine models. Okay, so it turns out that the simplest wine model, if you don't count alcohol, of course, is, is a mixture of tartaric. Tartaric is a prevailing acid in wine. Iron too, which is prevailing metal in, in, in wine. In fact, you know, they told me also there is a cup, and I asked them, is there a saccharum oxidase there? So, so, so it's, it's, it's a very, really amazing thing. So, so the simplest mixture is tartaric iron, and when you open a bottle of wine, then uh, oxygen gets in. So you have a mixture of, of uh, tartaric oxygen and iron. And when you measure dissolved oxygen, you start from quarter or uh, uh, millimole, see what is happening. First half an hour, nothing happens. And then reaction runs with, with a full speed, almost a constant speed, <laughs> until you run out of oxygen and iron two is converted to iron three. And this is really remarkable. So we figured that, uh, that uh, you can explain this by, by really chain of, uh, chains of, uh, and a mixture of, of electron, transfer, electron transfer reactions. But in the simplest uh, case, uh, in, in you know, simplest words, you can, exp you can explain this by this. That is, <clears throat> that is initially, uh, during initiation, uh, oxygen gets activated, okay, like, like in biology. Uh, iron two complexes slowly. Uh, donate two electrons to, uh, to oxygen, and you have very tiny amount of hydrogen peroxide present in the, in the mixture. And now you have a classic mixture. You have hydrogen peroxide, tartaric acid, and iron. So reaction begin to, uh, begin to run, and amazingly, a reaction of tartaric acid oxidation produces more hydrogen peroxide, and reaction ra runs with acceleration. So this accelerated reaction is a classic Semyonov uh, chain reaction with a with, uh, chain with positive, uh, positive feedback. You can understand that this is really a uh, Semyonov chain reaction by, by analyzing the schema that we have. And if you stare at it just long enough, then you will see only two equations. I needed to <laughs> see the first order. And when you analyze kinetic matrix of, this, uh, of these two equations, then you'll find that one eigenvalue is negative. So it means that there is, there is exponential expansion. And it's stabilized by, by, uh, by terminating reactions. And you have, you have this. And you have this, uh, this wonderful, uh, mysterious uh, uh, <coughs> uh, oxidation of tartaric, uh, tartaric acid, which is running like, like a train. Now, all of this is happening at low pH, 2.5, but at high pH, reaction is much uh, slower, uh, more sluggish, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in fact, as a function of pH, it demonstrates a critical, critical behavior. Now, I think that uh, one of the conclusions that we make uh, is that, that this is oxidation of wine is a classic Fenton reaction without hydrogen peroxide, okay? Because hydrogen peroxide is produced internally. So this is very uh, interesting. Now, this is, of course, a very interesting story, and we still continue uh, exploring adding alcohol and adding uh, different acids, et cetera, et cetera. But I would not be interested in this if it were not related to, to this reaction. This is a respiration reaction that is happening in our cells and the subject that I've been doing for, for the past 20 years. Okay, so what is happening in our cells is that oxygen gets, gets four electrons. Four electrons, one at a time. So first you have superoxide, then hydrogen peroxide, then hydroxyl, etc. So respiratory chain would not uh, release free radicals to the cell. But 
the whole chain is still producing hydrogen peroxide. And when hydrogen peroxide meets, meets iron too, you have classic phantom. And this phantom will produce free radicals, which will destroy components of the cell. And that is the part of, of uh, aging, biological aging of the cell. So this is very interesting. Of course, uh, as a matter of fact, hydrogen peroxide has uh, been recognized now as a main uh, signaling molecule in uh, redox biology, which is responsible for epige epigenetic uh, uh, changes and, and, and uh, uh, metabolic uh, cancer cell reprogramming. So this is, this, is, this is going to be really great. So hydrogen peroxide plays, plays a crucial role. And all of this is happening in our cells, in mitochondria. And here is uh, the <laughs> redox enzymes that we've been studying uh, for, for the past 20 years. Uh, structure of all of them now is known. The structure of the first uh, enzyme, which is called uh, complex one, uh, is, has been sold by a friend, uh, Leo Sosnov, uh, 10 years ago. And here is the enzyme, uh, which is the first, first enzyme in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, chain, which does the following. So it takes uh, two electrons from NADH and passes uh, these electrons to ubiquinone using this iron sulfur cluster chain, which I know that Garnet is, uh, is uh, very much interested in. They made, they made absolutely fantastic progress with this. But we were uh, uh, about, uh, we, were, uh, we, we, we published first paper on the subject. And here is electron transfer, what it does. It turns out that it generates a proton pumping. And this proton pumping creates proton gradient, which eventually drives ATP synthase, which Rudy uh, has been studying uh, uh, most recently. And uh, our work was, was to study, <coughs> in fact, uh, all the aspects of, of these enzymes, in particular how electrons tunnel. And, and uh, this is continuation of a subject that I picked up uh, here at Caltech from, from Harry Gray and Jay Winkler on tunneling. Uh, and, and then how this electron tunneling is coupled to proton translocation. So the most recent paper is that, that we discuss how, how this uh, reaction of ubiquinone reduction is generating power to pump protons. Of course, uh, in order to reduce quinone, you need to have two electrons, but also two protons. And when protons, uh, to reduce this molecule, begin to move, they start pushing other protons in the system. And there is a correlated motion of the system, which, in fact, can result uh, to, uh, in, in proton pumping. But the story is in the, in the making, so it is just developing, and, and we're we are in the process of, of doing this. But as I said, that uh, one uh, new thing that came out of the studies is that the system is producing, of course, proton gradient, which drives ATP synthesis. But the new aspect is that it also generates hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide for, for epigenetic changes, for signaling, and uh, you know, cancer cells reprogramming is, 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 uh, is happening uh, uh, via this molecule. So this is really uh, something. So this molecule will be declared uh, perhaps at some point as a molecule of a decade or something like that. So it's, 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 a, great, it's a great new development for us. Um, and uh, I would like to <coughs> conclude with a thought that uh, it's really amazing a uh, unity and uh, analogy of uh, what is happening in, the, in a glass of wine in terms of oxidation and in our cells. Because in both cases, it's phantom without hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is made uh, inside of the cell and inside of a glass, uh, glass of wine. And of course, uh, and by the way, uh, Feynman, uh, he had, uh, had a piece which he called uh, uh, the universe in a, in a uh, glass of wine. I would not uh, go as, as, as far as, as that, but definitely there is amazing similarity of, of oxidation processes in wine and in the cell. And it's all about electron transfer. So it's all about electron transfer. And, and you know, if you know the subject, what could you do with electron transfer without the uh, uh, electron transfer Marcus theory? So cheers to you, Rudy, and happy birthday. There is a question, uh, is it feral or uh, hydroxyl radical? And uh, there are, it's, it's a, uh, you know, the, this, the, the uh, yeah, it depends on pH. And uh, the subject has been discussed for 100 years yeah. and still people talking about it. Yeah. So this is, is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh, <laughs> exactly. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> now, yeah, it's, it's a great, uh, great question. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that this, this amazing uh, uh, chain reaction is happening in a clean uh, mixture of tartaric uh, uh, iron II and, and oxygen. But once you start mixing alcohol, it, uh, it inhibits, inhibits this, this uh, train-like uh, like, like oxidation. So also, uh, malic uh, citric acids and then everything, your copper and, uh, and, uh, and sulfides, uh, they, they also kind of slow down this thing. So there are, there, there are lots of practical conclusions from this work, I should tell you. <laughs> What's your answer, though? Should you breathe or not? <laughs> It should breathe because, because, because my colleagues from, from the top rate technology department, they explained to me, in fact, you know, I asked them the same question, that it turns out that uh, it's not a simple oxidation and degradation. There are some beneficial effects, okay? There are some beneficial effects and, and, uh, and some reactions, uh, some reactions uh, uh, with oxygen uh, are beneficial. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, well, they say that, uh, you know, it, it's, just, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's useful. In fact, by, by the way, when in, ma in winemaking, they do allow some oxygen get, get in, okay, to, to do many different, different things, you know, bacteria, et cetera. So yeast, uh, health, uh, et cetera. But, but the pure chemistry also plays, plays the role. So it is advised, you know. We can try it this evening, by the way. <laughs> yeah. On. Okay, good. All right, so um, let's... Uh bring the next speaker up. So um, our next speaker is uh, Yongfeng Zhang. Um, Yongfeng uh, uh, worked with Rudy, but is now the uh, CEO and president and uh, CSO and director of Amphistar Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is a public, uh, publicly traded company. Um, and he'll be telling us about 35 years of learning from Rudy and celebrating Rudy's 100th birthday. It is my great honor to give a talk here to celebrate Louis' 100th birthday. My topic is 35 years of learning from Rudy. Rudy and I first met in 1987 at Blue Heaven Laboratories, where he delivered a speech I worked for Rudy as his postdoctor fellow during 1988 to 1990. So after, oh, sorry, after Mary, my wife, and I started our own business, we still frequently visited Rudy and his family members and continue to learn from him. Without noticing, for me, it has been 35 years of learning from Rudy. It is well known that Rudy works very hard and works very long hours. Once, while Rudy was traveling, I caught a bad cold, but continued to work. A colleague later reported to Rudy about my illness. Rudy smiled and said to me, we hard to push the illness away. <laughs> Our understanding this is Rudy's working ethics. So we decided to follow him. Once Rudy and I discussed a uh, drafted uh, manuscript. I noticed a uh, uh, grammatical uh, error I made and immediately uh, fixed it, the error and apologized to Rudy. Rudy took off his reading glasses, mildly looked at me and said, imagine if I wrote an article in Chinese, how many mistakes what I made. His patience, care, and uh, fatherliness deeply touched me. Rudy also um, always keep active communication 
with the people who do the actual experiments. Rudy also advocates multiple discipline in which he believes it will result in breakthrough discovery. And he always instructs us that most important and the key information are from experiments, no more from multiple fields. Recently, we did a search in the web of science with the keyword, uh, Marcus theory. Hmm? And uh, we found that Marcus theory for electron transfer was studied in 72 fields. Here is a list of uh, some uh, <coughs> fields, including sensor and probe, and bio sensors, and the uh, photocatalyst, uh, including some for um, pharmacology and uh, toxicology, and uh, many, uh, many fields. So, Rudy emphasized have the knowledge from multiple fields create his theory, turns out that his theory also used by many, many fields. <coughs> Once Rudy visited our pharmaceutical facility and noticed many PCAM knowledge is used by pharmaceutical research and manufacturing. So uh, Rudy said, and uh, it seems uh, that having Chemi physical chemists switch to pharmaceutical research is indeed a shortcut to success. So this is the Rudy's the consistent the humor to encourage the latecomers. And uh, in fact, and we use a lot of knowledge in PCM and, and, and also the physics. This is a real example. And the product uh, um, in our development. So um, this is an um, iron uh, supplement that is a sucrophilic oxyhydroxide. This is a nanometer particle. There's a um, consists of a core. Inside this core, there is about, about 100 iron atoms. The size of this core is about four and a half nanometer tested by small angle X-ray scattering. So this core of, of the, the, um, the iron, we sometimes call it the, the iron molecule cluster, surrounded by uh, many ligands of sucrose. The total particle size, including the ligands, is about eight to 10 nanometer. Interestingly, so this product meet Curie Ware's law, but there's no any lattice structure based on X-ray diffraction. And we even can find the Curie temperature is 75K, and, uh, yeah, 75K by many study. The real structure of this, uh, the iron, uh, must be tested by Moseball spectrum at a very low temperature, six Kelvin. And uh, as a postdoctoral fellow with Ludi, also I luckily and uh, you know, get my um, 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 <laughs> another best half. So I don't know my uh, Mary also um, also here uh, work at Caltech. So so Ludi bring me to Caltech to the apple tree. <laughs> okay. At our wedding, uh, Ludis spoke on behalf of my parents. And uh, that beautiful memory, and we are uh, accompany us for a lifetime. This is 1990. So Ludi is, um, is uh, speaking here. 
So for a long time, Ludi support us, also encourage us. So Ludi uh, de delivered the... Oh, oh back, backwards, sorry. Yeah, Ludi gave a uh, uh, speech uh, in our company, and uh, here is after Ludi's speech. This one is the, the uh, meeting area, and Ludi is here. And uh, during on this one, um, Professor Henry Gray is given a uh, speech. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this picture okay. is. <laughs> yeah, you here. <yeah. laughs> it's evidence. <laughs> what am I doing there, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in 2003, um, Mary and I um, meet with Ludi and also prefer Seeing Yang at Pasadena. And uh, um, our son uh, is at Ludi's home. Uh, this is uh, Ludi, Seeing Yang, and, and myself attend the company's advisory uh, meeting. Mary and I stay um, with Ludi's home. And in 1919, Ludi's family, Henry and his wife, and you know, uh, Ludi, Cam, Ellen, right? <laughs> uh, in the Christmas party. Okay. Ludi, happy 100th birthday. You are truly blessed. You have lived 100 years and have 10 decades of heavenly memories. Thank you, Ludi. I just wanted to add that um, Jack and Mary gave a uh, generous gift um, uh, to support this uh, celebration, and we're very thankful for that. And in addition to that gift, there's also a uh, special um, surprise at the uh, dinner, uh, and we'll uh, from them, and we'll also all enjoy that. So that we have that to look forward to. So thank you, thank you, Jack and Mary, for that. The last speaker for this uh, first part of the meeting is uh, Sherry uh, Xiaoping Xu. So, Sherry, oh, you're already there. OK, all right. Um, so, Sherry. Uh, Sherry uh, is a research fellow at uh, Academia Sinica in uh, Taiwan. And uh, she'll be telling us about Tostada and yes. electron transfer. So I look forward to that, Sherry. Thank you. So I'm so happy to be here, Rudy. I never thought I can be here in such an interesting and nice occasion. So um, I was, I mean, my Chinese name is Chao Ping, and uh, I, I've, I've been a Chao Ping in Caltech, and later on, I was Cherry after we moved out. So uh, a little bit about myself, maybe. Yeah, this is, um, uh, I was here 1992 to 1998 with Rudy. And actually, I didn't want to graduate, OK? Until I did got this uh, nice fellowship, a middle fellowship at Berkeley. I went there for a few years. And then we moved back to Taipei, and I work in Academia Seneca, um, a government fund research lab, until now, OK? Um, so being very first time in so far away from home, and I, uh, whenever, I still remember when there is a very rarely seen rainy day, I would get homesick, OK? Because in Taipei, it rains so much. Anyhow, so when we finally moved back to Taipei, I thought I would never get homesick. And I was wrong. <laughs> because uh, some years later, I found myself craving for Mexican food. <laughs> so, um, so if you know Taipei, it's a very good city for all kinds of good food from everywhere in the world, except Mexican. <laughs> you, will, you will find food named Mexican, but I won't call it Mexican, OK? So uh, because I have my taste, right? So it's only until recently I find, did I realize that where that special taste come from. It's actually the Friday lunch. Um, Rudy is so kind and generous that almost every week we will have a lunch together, and very often in the SNEM. 
And the Athenaeum serves a wide variety of all kinds of food. It allows a poor graduate student like me to try and every week. And, and then until later, I found myself keep ordering this nice dish. This is as good as you can, <laughs> as 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 can get. But I, I'm sure that that version in my memory so, looks so much better than this one. OK. But after a while, I realized what I miss the most is not just the taste of tostada. It's actually the nice people. The nice people I have met in this group and I've learned so much from. And the very good interaction. We would actually debate for the whole afternoon and then go back and work in the evening. OK, so I, I learned so much from everybody here. And I still remember there has been one question. Almost every one of us have asked Rudy, especially when we were about to leave. Uh, it's, uh, we would ask Rudy, what do you think the future of theoretical chemistry would be. OK. You see the kind of anxiety and the fear for this that we have, okay, and then stepping out of this very nice group. And Rudy would give a um, very nice and long answer, elaborating, elaborating on many aspects he found interesting. And the only thing I can remember are just two key words, material and biology. Which is still quite true, I mean, looking back 30 years from now, OK? So um, this is uh, the slide I would use to introduce my research uh, um, scope. And, and uh, just like to start up being a nice mixture of this crispy taco shell and salad and also the smooshy beans and sauces, I found myself, I mean, after many years of looking back, I found myself handling a mixture of problems that has to do with material and has to do with biology. So just a quick flavor uh, let you know that, oh, I'm sorry. It should come up. OK, so for example, I was able to take the things I learned here, the statistical mechanics and uh, uh, stochastic dynamics, to explain why some neuron would grow uh, for large variation in their sizes. This is my friend, um, Chi Hong Lee, also working at the Seneca. Um, and when we first met, he said he was able to identify certain factors that will make neuron grow bigger. And certain factors, certain genes, will make neuron grow smaller. And if you take both away, what happens? They will be only the same size, but more vari variant. I said, wow, that's a good problem for a theoretician. And I managed to help him conclude his work using some, some nice graph and nice uh, simulation. <coughs> um, and my, my sort of special interest in this kind of uncertainties in biology was also um, recognized by a very good friend of mine, Su Xing, and uh, we co advised a graduate student, Ho Wei. And we proved some very weird name called upstream of the leading frame. Some controlling element on the messenger RNA would actually have a function of noise reduction, namely keeping the gene expression more uniform from cell to cell. Um, so this is actually going back to um, the, the, word, the more related to material. This is the very first paper I published with Rudy. And there is already uh, something called electronic coupling I have in my mind. We were using very simple tight dynamic model, solving uh, electron transfer across a long chain molecules. At that time, my program programming skill was so bad that when the chain goes longer, I encounter some numerical problem. And then I devised a very cute method to, to derive some, some expression such that that numerical problem can be overcome. And at that time, I didn't know that I later would join uh, Martin had Gordon's lab and learned how to do quantum mechanics uh, for electrons properly. So I was able to devise um, a bunch of methods uh, handling different kinds of two-state situation, either ground state or excited state um, quantum chemistry model. Uh, we can uh, could still go ahead and then do uh, electronic coupling. So with that in mind, we also uh, try to do machine learning, try to skip if I can solve many times, maybe we can build a model and without having to solve the problem properly. This is actually a really, really nice uh, shortcut. Uh, one of the things I, I've been curious in my mind is that when back to the time when Alexi and Xu Yu were talking about spin boson Hamiltonian, how the system will be fluctuated by a bunch of harmonic oscillators. Uh, we were talking about fluctuation for the diagonal measurement, whether it's two by two or many by many. Um, I always have this wondering, like, well, what about our flower measurement? 
they certainly are going to be changed when we treat them as a constant, so what's going on? So anyhow, we have this greedy wish uh, for many years, and I have finally the tool to solve it. Basically, uh, if I have a machine learning model, I can follow a pair of molecules in a dynamic trajectory for a long time, long enough, and accumulate so many, I can calculate their spectral density doing statistically pro statistic properly. And we recently said, OK, it will be subomics. <coughs> and uh, uh, the, the black spectrum for different temperature, different system. And it, will it actually was resembled by uh, rotation uh, motion. Mostly. Back to the group. Okay, it's also a picture I like a lot, and many people I miss so much here. Um, my husband painting. Um, this is Yuri, Brian, Sachi is here, and Laura. I remember Rudy and Laura were very thoughtful when it comes to dining, like dinner with guests, and they would talk to interpret in turn to all the people on the table, to this person, then the next person, then the one next, then the one. And I enjoy that so much because we don't just talk in science. We also talk about things happening back in our life, things happening back in our homeland, and so on and so forth. And uh, there were ones I don't remember who was visiting, but Laura started to tell me that Rudy really was a set. So why? Because he was working with my manuscript. Oh. And I was upset too. Okay, so at that time, I, I couldn't respond very well. I, I, the best thing I can thought of is, yeah, in this process, I've learned how not to take it personally. And then I regret. Uh, I was like, oh, I shouldn't say that. But it was too late. Um, so the next day, Rudy called me into his office. I was like, oh, OK. But then he apologized to me. I was like, Yes, this is Rudy. This is Rudy. Um, I, I know how bad, looking back, I know how bad my writing was. I'm not the only one who, can, who cannot write good papers. But, but I gradually learned, and I really, really appreciate that process. Rudy take all the patients, correct every word, hand by hand, over and over again, until I really see my problem, until I really know how to put my words. And uh, now I have my own research group. And uh, I have my students. And if I'm lucky, I would get graduate students who are just like this young little me there, who have a lot of ideas in mind, but don't know how to spell them out nicely. And I would be, actually, I, I have to learn my in this aspect. I would from time to time still get very impatient, or nearly over the age. And uh, if I'm about to like, crash my computer, I would just sit down and think about Rudy and Laura. And, uh, and then I'll come down, take a deep breath, and then go on. Yeah. So this is a, a picture we took. I, I took because Mayor was recent years has been organizing birthday parties across the internet. And this picture, I think, it was taken exactly last year today on the internet. And uh, gee, I just miss everybody here so much. And. I want to thank Mayor's organization, too. And uh, it was Rudy's, I would say, looking back, it was Rudy's thoughtfulness, the courtesy of being so respectful, the generous support to all of us. Um, and such things has been in my, in, in, in also affected me so much, such so that when I grow up to an independent researcher, no matter where I go, where I end up to be, I would just have this piece of difference in me. I think I'm very proud of that. And I want to thank Rudy for this. So to me, Tostada has this symbolic meaning of so much. And Rudy, thank you. Congratulations, and happy birthday. OK, so um, we are going to start with uh, Charles Mukamel, uh, the distinguished professor in the Department of Chemistry at uh, Irvine. Uh, Shao has uh, been a friend of Rudy for many years and a friend of our division for many years. Um, and he'll be talking today about Rudy, a visionary, an inspiring scientist and educator. Thank you, Shao. Uh, I'm really pleased to, to talk in this wonderful symposium and to see so many people that I have, haven't seen for many years. Uh, I have known Rudy over 
a long time since I was a graduate student, and I was always inspired by his uh, vision and penetrating questions. So before uh, starting, I would like to show you how in Lausanne they appreciate getting a Nobel Prize. This is the parking spot <laughs> for... Uh, I was really amazed by this uh, generous recognition. And uh, if, Rudy, you ever want to move to Lausanne, you will get a similar uh, parking. The best parking space that he got the Nobel Prize. OK. <laughs> yeah. This reminds me, once in Irvine, uh, we, we had a Nobel Prize, a, a person winning the Nobel Prize. And the president sent a message to all the faculty saying, we are very pleased and honored and so on. And a sign of appreciation, he will get a parking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so uh, uh, in this occasion, I thought I will mention a study that I have seen uh, like 10 years ago by a group of health uh, economists uh, who did uh, uh, study the correlation between longevity and winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, they took data, uh, after 50 years, the data are released, and they analyzed the people who were nominated for the prize versus, as a control group versus the people who actually got the prize. And they found a positive correlation, which means winning the Nobel Prize does increase your longevity. <laughs> Uh, they claim to correct it for the fact that if you live longer, you are more likely to get the Nobel Prize. I assume that they did it. <laughs> but then they give an um, um, analogy from the uh, wildlife kingdom that it's well known that uh, uh, animals who get appreciated by their uh, colleagues uh, uh, have longer lives. So they attribute this to this uh, uh, recognition. Uh, I have known uh, uh, Rudy for, really, for many years. And I remember one discussion that we had once. We were uh, discussing uh, the, uh, how science progresses and how nowadays People are doing very sophisticated simulations with supercomputers and multi-parameters and so on. And I mentioned to him innocently that in his time, you could have gotten away with a one-parameter formula uh, and uh, go to fame. And then Rudy did not like it, and he told me it was a two-parameter formula. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, 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 Rudy uh, influenced uh, his electron transfer uh, theory, uh, identified an important collective solvation coordinate that can be used to, uh, uh, to model electron transfer processes. But uh, this theory has long implications in many areas of uh, chemistry and biology uh, and material science. For example, uh, a proton transfer, uh, electron conductivity, uh, photosynthesis. Uh, in my own field, I've been working on ultra-fast uh, multidimensional spectroscopy. And the, the Marcus model is a key in um, interpreting uh, multidimensional experiments. In fact, you see more than the electron transfer rate. You see all kinds of multidimensional correlations. And they can all be uh, understood and explained well uh, by, uh, by Marcus' theory. Um, so in, in multidimensional spectroscopy, you uh, subject the system to several short pulses, and you watch what's happening as a function of the delays. And uh, using the Marcus theory, it's possible to, uh, to explain many of these experiments, in particular in photosynthetic uh, systems. And these spectroscopies have been 
developing from the NMR in the radio waves till X-ray. Right now, there are many experiments that are done in the X-ray to study core excitations. And again, uh, uh, we cannot really interpret and understand uh, the depth of these experiments uh, without using uh, Marcus, uh, uh, Marcus' ideas. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Rudy on uh, uh, creating uh, some summer schools in chemical physics. We have been discussing uh, a lot about the fact that current students, current I mean in the year 2000, were not getting enough analytical tools. They are going right away to doing large scale computations and the curriculum in chemistry does not really provide uh, solid tools for uh, analyzing things analytically. So uh, Rudy's idea was to create a summer school uh, in order to, uh, to bring uh, these uh, techniques to the uh, young scientists. And uh, we have organized two schools. The first one was in the year 2000, and where we brought many speakers for two weeks. And it was really a pleasure to see uh, interactions and long discussions. And Rudy was very, very involved in, uh, uh, in all of it. So the first school uh, was in 2000, and then there was a second school that uh, 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 two years uh, later. So in all of this and in all our discussions, I always found, found uh, Rudy to be very inspiring. Uh, his thinking is always rooted in experiments. And that's the power, uh, one of the powers of his work, because experiments force you to, to be honest and to keep uh, to reality rather than going in some uh, uh, obscure parameter spaces that have no relevance. And Rudy's work in the electron transfer, the RRKM, his semi-classical work, was always leading uh, in all these directions. So thank you, Rudy. Okay, so um, our next speaker is uh, Greg Voth. Uh, Greg Voth is a professor at the uh, University of Chicago, um, and uh, he will be telling us, it's a very uh, broad title, how a broad graduate education enabled new science from quantum mechanics to understanding uh, viruses. Thank you, Greg. You bet. So we're really ahead, Michelle. <laughs> so there's an interesting thing I want to say um, kind of bootstrapping on what Shaw said, you know, Rudy's famous formula, the law of intersecting parabolas is, is three parameters, right? But they're not independent. So if you know two things, you can predict the other. We're currently at this inflection point in science where machine learning is everywhere, right? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, you pick up a journal and half the papers, a, a neural network has 200 to 300,000 parameters in it. And, uh, and I really wonder, uh, where this is leading us. I say this, uh, you know, a little bit concerned, but we'll see. So the, the, I, I'm in the, on the Marcus camp, I'll tell you, with the fewer parameters. Anyway, so what, um, what am I talking about here? I want to I wanna, uh, give a tribute really to, uh, first of all, I want to start my clock. Uh, um, I want to give a tribute really to, to Rudy's group, the environment it had, but also Caltech in general. Um, I think here we were allowed to, to learn a lot. And I know I took a lot of classes a full year. And I think even in my second year, I took some physics classes. The current trend is, is to compress that, right? To make students take fewer classes, get them in the lab, learn less. I've even heard people say, you know, oh, you don't really need to know quantum mechanics, stuff like that. And I, and I want to show you an example of where this uh, learning um, uh, has really paid off for me. So what do I mean by this? We've been <clears throat> very interested in pushing the scales of mostly biological systems, but not all. This is a picture of a cytoskeleton. And these are uh, actin proteins. Um, and I think we all know we have a Nobel laureate here in ARIA that, uh, that really is, 
shared this Nobel Prize for molecular dynamics simulation, these kind of things at the atomistic scale. And what I've been really keen on is pushing that scale up sort of physics-based calculations where we can begin to understand the assembly of thousands of proteins. So this is, this is our goal. A few years ago, we, and what is important about this is simplification. So uh, this is what we call coarse graining, right? So we're representing these proteins by a handful of objects. We call them beads or sites or whatever, they're sort of quasi-particles. And the hard part is how you uh, simplify your system, but you don't throw away all the information you need, right? That's really critical. And so we figured out how to do this um, a, a few years ago, about 20 years ago, actually. Um, and that is, how do you start with a, a good theory? Statistical mechanics is a good one. And how do you uh, map something like this little hairpin, for example, into a simpler object, but keep the core physics, right? This is what we call bottom-up coarse graining. And uh, there's a, this is the most mathematical slide. I just have to show it. Uh, the hard way to do this is you would, you would map these collections of atoms, maybe it's the center of mass of an amino acid, into particles. You would introduce collective variables, just like Rudy did with electron transfer. You would integrate over uh, the motions of the fast motions, and you'd be able to identify what this interaction is, right? And it, and it turns out it's a free energy surface. So what's left in your problem once you've done these transformations is a surface in which you have enthalpy and entropy, and the particles move on that. The problem is it's impossible to, to do this, right? This is really hard. This is still many, many degrees of freedom. So the thing we figured out <coughs> was, and actually it was machine learning, okay? Uh, was how to trick variational, you know, variational methods. This is the Institute of Feynman, right? One of his most famous things was the, the theory of the polaron, an electron in a polar crystal, which he mapped into a harmonic oscillator. And that mapping tells you about the physics. Well, we were able to, to use a, a way of formulating essentially a least squares fit, believe it or not, statistically, to figure out how to do this, okay? And this paper would be in the, the gallery of one of the speakers of being cited a lot. Okay, that's not enough. So we wanted to push these scales, and I'm gonna show you the outcome of doing this. It turns out you have to get very aggressive in how you simplify these objects. So for example, the actin protein, I'm representing it here by 12 of these coarse grain particles. There are 375 amino acids plus the bound nucleotide, ATP, so you've got 20 to 30 amino acids per particle here, right? Not the other way around. Not, not like I showed you here, which is really a very high resolution thing still. This is very coarse. Now, <clears throat> I ask you, what tells you when you look at that object that it should just follow Newton's equations of motion? It's ridiculous, right? There's no reason for that. So this is where the quantum came in. And, and, and as I said, at Caltech, all the education, I was very lucky to do a postdoc with Bill Miller, and who's here, and David Chandler. I learned more about quantum mechanics. I realized that, really, you have a lot of freedom for representing how this object should behave. And this allowed us to introduce what's called an ultra coarse grain model. And, and it's a simple idea. The simple idea is you have these particles. They move pretty Newton-like, but they have internal states, just like quantum mechanics. And those internal states can change depending on the dynamics. And a, and a very good example for actin, you have ATP. It can hydrolyze chemically with a phosphate still bound. It can dissociate the phosphate and have ADP. So that copper ball needs three states, right? And the chemistry that's going on there is tied to what these guys are doing. And in fact, what these guys are doing are tied to this chemistry. So it's very much like a coupled quantum mechanical problem, like a non-adiabatic dynamics, right? As many of you have learned this, you nuclei move along, you have an electronic change of electronic surface, and they feel different forces. So we were able to formulate this idea, and it, it allows us to include all kinds of things that are present in, in reality into this modeling uh, implicitly, not explicitly. And so let me show you an outcome of this. Let me see if I've got enough time. Close enough. Yeah. Um, uh oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to show you um, an application of this that's really quite interesting, and this is to HIV. Uh, in HIV, the bad actors are these gag proteins and, of course, the RNA of the virus. So they're produced, they hijack your translation, and you produce these gags, they assemble on your cell membrane if you're infected. 
you sprout off a virus, which you know in the last few years we've seen the spike proteins more than we ever want to see the rest of our life. These viruses go off, the HIV protease starts chopping up the GAG, that's a, a big drug target, protease inhibitors. And then you have a really interesting self-assembly. This, this green part called the capsid domain assembles around the genome and you form this capsid. And it turns out that assembly involves about 1,000 a, a proteins, maybe 1,200. And it can also be done in the laboratory in in vitro controlled experiments. You don't just have to do it in, in the biological context. So we said, you know, let's do this. We set out uh, using this fancy technology I told you about. This is the first paper we published. And let me show you what we're trying to deal with. It's about 1,000 to 1,200 proteins. When the, when the protease cuts this up, you dimerize two pieces. There's a very strong dimerization. And they go in this lattice. If you look closely, it's hexagonal, but it's quite complicated. One half of the protein dimer is in one hexamer. The other half is in the other hexamer. And according to Mr. Euler, you need 12 pentamers. They're not different proteins. You need pentameric defects to close this shell. And inside it is, is the RNA, okay? And that is a big job. So we uh, coarse-grained it. We used all the technology we had, but there was, there was one thing that was really hard, and that is if you look at this protein, you know, it's got these helical bundles. They're very robust, but this thing ought to be able to move all over the place. And in fact, there were NMR experiments. These are cones of motion of this thing that you have all kinds of conformational states and it's literally impossible to do that kind of sampling in your modeling and assemble 1200 proteins right so this is where this ultra coarse graining idea it turns out that all you really need is a variable that goes along with your model that tells you you're in the right conformation or you're not and typically it's about five to ten percent of the time you're in the right conformation there's some sort of a time scale of correlation, and you can do this. Forget about this, is just how we trick the model to include that physics. And so we thought we had scored a victory, right? This is the actual simulation. Crowding agents called FICOL, lots of proteins. I'm showing you the assembly of this capsid. And we identify three kinetic processes. One is these nucleating agents, so these are three of those, those trimers in a triangle. They grow the lattice, they're shown in blue. When the lattice grows, it, the proteins pack and it curves, and then you need to trap some of those pentamers. If I keep running this, it'll close. You have to trap some of those pentamers to close the surface. So it's what we call a kinetic funnel. You get three uh, kinetic processes to grow these things that must be synchronized properly or it won't work out. Okay, so we thought that was good. There were two things that bothered me. Uh, one is it always grew from the small end, and that doesn't seem reasonable. If you're gonna encase the RNA in the actual virus, you wouldn't wanna grow from down there, you'd wanna grow from up here, right? Secondly, uh, my postdoc, who was so terrorized by working three years on trying to make this work, didn't really tell me that most of the time he got tubules, not this. This is more of an accident, okay. So along comes those dreaded experimentalists that Rudy loves. They say, you know what, Greg? Now that we have higher resolution structures, we find an anion stuck right in the middle of both these hexamers and pentamers, this IP6 anion. It's a phosphate, it's very ubiquitous in the cell. And it loves to go right into those uh, either pentamers or hexamers. The pentamers it loves a little more by about five kilocalories per mole. We can actually calculate that. And the reason for that is there are arginines here and that guy likes to just go in there. Okay, so this is critical. If you do in vitro experiments and you don't have IP6 with this protein, you get tubes. Uh-oh, that's not good. I'll be done. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry. Uh, if you add a little IP6, you get cigars, right? You start closing the tubes. If you add more, you start getting lots of things that look like HIV cores. So our modeling was robust enough that we can recapitulate this without really reformulating a model. I want to just focus on this movie. What happens here, growth of a lattice, You'll see pentamers, the red guys, come and go, and when they come, the IP6 nails them and stabilizes them, and then it's game over. You grow the capsid. So this cap, a few, IP6, uh, I, I, a few pentamers that's, that have high curvature region, the IP6 stabilizes them, stops them from healing, and you can reproduce this over and over and over again. Uh, this is really striking. So this is time. This is a number of proteins assembling, you see up over a thousand. 
Down in here, it's just, and this is the number of pentamers, just one or two, right? Down in here where you're growing. And then just enough, it takes off. Zoom grows that thing. And as a control, you should always have controls when you do these things. If I remove the IP6, I better get a tubule. And you'll see, there's no IP6, no orange balls here. The pentamers try to come, but then they heal in this lattice. The lattice wants to be hexamers, and I'll, and I'll get a tubule, get a long tubules. And that's what happens experimentally. And we did not parameterize our model to get this outcome, right? You always need controls. Okay, so, uh, so that, that's it. I, I do want to say one thing. These are the people that did the work, and I want to say one more very important thing to me that I think some of you would appreciate. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, when I was a graduate student here, I think I wrote about 10 papers. And four of them did not have the great Rudy Marcus as a co-author. Okay, he just let me write papers. And how many advisors do that these days, right? Um, not many. And probably including me, right? So I, I give the lecture. You know, I worked hard to write that grant proposal. <laughs> you know, you can't do this. Okay. But here's the real story. Um, I thought the reason Rudy didn't put his name on these papers is because he didn't think they were any good. Okay, and he thought they were not worthy of his name. But it turns out I go to graduation 36 years ago, May, and I am told I won the Clouser doctoral prize that Rudy had nominated me for. And that's my father and mother. Uh, this is the Pasadena newspaper. He's channeling Churchill there, not peace, right? It's Churchill, or V, v for us. And so, um, Rudy, thank you very much, I think. He admired that I had independence and was willing to do new things. And this uh, lasted my parents uh, till the end of their lives. And it was really very touching. So thank you, Rudy. OK, our next speaker is Sandor. Uh, Sandor, um, I mean, many of you will recognize him as a frequent uh, visitor in this, uh, in this division, a uh, longtime collaborator and a research scientist in uh, at Rudy Marx's group. Uh, he's also an associate professor um, at Azusa Pacific University. Um, today, he'll be telling us about, um, about a topic which um, has been one of Rudy's interests in recent years, uh, the interconversion of chemical and mechanical energy in a biological motor F1 uh, ATPA. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, Barnett. Right. Um, happy birthday, Rudy. Um, many more to come. Um, I, um, so I'm going to. Uh, tell you hopefully within those 10 minutes a, um, a couple of stories uh, which hopefully illustrate um, one of the things that I learned from Rudy, which is uh, stay close to experiment and learn, you know, learn more and, and keep learning more and even more about the details of all those pesky experiments. And so, um, so the um, so in the past decade or so, um, working uh, with Rudy, uh, we looked at basically the time-dependent behavior um, of single molecules, in particular F1 ATPAs, um, this rotary uh, biomotor. Um, so the idea was um, you can, um, experimentalists, uh, I guess, they can, um, they can image uh, single motors. This is an F1 ATPAs um, uh, looked from uh, uh, basically the top, uh, uh, as, it, as it were. Um, with the uh, barrel structure uh, inside this rotary shaft. And so uh, what can be done uh, experimentally is you take this four nanometer object, um, you could attach to the rotary part um, a optical probe. Uh, in this example, would be a 10 times larger um, uh, gold nanoparticle. And that can be imaged with, uh, with optics. Um, scattering techniques, uh, et cetera, in this particular example, scattering techniques. And the, um, this is an example of, of the actual experiment. Um, it's not real time, but uh, you can actually create a movie. Uh, what we see here is a diffraction limited image of um, uh, recorded by a CCD camera. And one can uh, 
basically uh, fit a airy function to this and uh, sort of find a centroid and follow that centroid mover, moving around and, and one sees this uh, rotational pattern. And so one of the interesting things about this experiment uh, is that the rotation uh, occurs uh, you know, consistently in one direction, but then, of course, we see the Brownian uh, uh, dynamics, uh, and this is almost like seeing the Brownian motion in real time. And the other thing that's, that can be seen is the stepping behavior. So these motors, like many other motors, um, they are stepping motors. And uh, we also see the, the sub-steps. So here we see three major steps and then resolved as two sub-steps. And so um, you know, the series of experiments uh, helped uh, the experimentalist um, uh, figure out what is the nature of those, those dwells, we call them, this, this point where this is a trajectory time, uh, that would be the rotational angle. And so the idea is that what we see here in these experiments um, is a partial picture of individual chemical reactions, if you will, uh, happening in the subunits of this rotary motor. And, but we don't see the full picture. So for example, here we see two substeps, and we, although you know, there should be four events, um, binding, hydrolysis, release of the two products, so at least four events, but only two are resolved. And so um, the, the questions that we are asking is, so how can theory help um, with some of the questions uh, around the single molecule uh, experiments. Uh, it, you know, we need to develop kind of a, a bit of a new statistical mechanics because the observation now are single molecule observations. And also, can we actually um, help, help somehow uh, experiment in increasing resolution, figuring out things that the experiment cannot see? And so um, the the two examples um, that I'm going to talk about, one is um, you know, probing time scales of milliseconds, and then the other one uh, looking at the microsecond time scale experiments. So um, the type of experiments that uh, we looked at many, many times and uh, with great care and even more care and you know, asking the experimentalist many, many questions. So one of uh, type of experiment is where um, this rotary probe uh, can be a permanent magnet. And so um, this is a magnetic tweezers kind of experiment. But you know, in this experiment, there are other things on top of that. Uh, for example, the, uh, there is the uh, scattering optics, but there's also turf microscopy. So there are three things on top of each other. And so one can then observe, for example, the occupancy uh, in terms of nucleotides uh, as a function of time, as well as the rotation angle. And so this type of experiments allow, um, allow people to um, basically uh, s manipulate the, the, rot the, the motor. So they, the, the motor can be externally uh, rotated clockwise, counterclockwise, stalled, etc. Uh, this particular example uh, shows trajectories of um, controlled rotation experiments. So uh, in this experiment, you know, the rotation was uh, done continuously. And so the tweezer, uh, the magnetic field is strong enough so that the angle of this uh, rotary shaft was forced to be a certain value, and then it was changed as a function of time at the constant angle. So another type of experiment would involve you know, stalling the motor and then releasing. And one common thing that these experiments uh, can provide is, um, is this idea that we could, we could get out rate constant of individual events. So for example, uh, the for forward and back rate constant for binding and release of ATP to the, to the binding sites. And so the idea is that you know, we, we have this picture where uh, theta is the, the rotation angle. So we have a slow coordinate and we have other fast coordinates. And so the, the, the picture that would apply is a rate constant that is actually angle dependent, rotation angle dependent. And um, but at the same time, because these are uh, controlled rotation experiments, it's out of equilibrium, uh, really. And so, um, you know, those fluctuation kind of theorem must be used uh, in order to, to get those rate constants accurately from, from these experiments. So um, 
the, the approach where, uh, that, that we took uh, involves two simple steps. Um, so let's build a thermodynamic cycle. This is for the ATP binding step. So the idea was uh, we could look at this uh, at, at one subunit, right? Let's look at one subunit and think about four states. Uh, the top states um, are states in which uh, the, the mag magnetic tweezer is turned on, and so the, the, the angle is forced to, to take a certain value. Uh, the lower one is where we don't have that constraint, so the system can relax. And then uh, between the top and the bottom states, the difference um, is that, uh, I mean, the, the left and the right states, the difference is that in one state we have an empty subunit, in the other state we have an ATP bound state. So uh, what what happens is going from an empty to, uh, to a bound state, there is rotation, presumably. So how is it then uh, the, the angle is fixed, and yet there is a change in the, in the structure? Um, so the idea was that if we allow the system to, um, to distort, uh, then we can indeed go from empty to bound state while the angle is held um, by the tweezer. And so uh, the difference then between these two pairs of states is that there is this sort of twisting energy. And that's where we thought we could in include, uh, well, put into this uh, model the, the mechanics, if you will, the angle-dependent mechanics. So um, basically, one can, um, can do a, a little bit of, of calculation here to get the free energy um, of, of the reaction uh, as a function of rotary angle uh, using this thermodynamic cycle idea. Now, but that was the free energy so, um, uh, of the reaction. So in order to actually get rate constants for binding and release, um, we needed another equation. And this is well-known equations here. Um, so the idea is that how is it possible that this equation might actually work uh, for these systems? Um, and so uh, there are reasons this is uh, possible. For example, you know, we could treat the, uh, the ATP binding and the release event as a group transfer event. Uh, and then there are other models, um, such as um, uh, models involving the uh, bond order conservation that, that lead to a quadratic formula. That's one on quadratic equation. So uh, the, the nice thing about it formally is that it provides uh, a relationship between the standard free energy and uh, the barrier free energy. And then that g gives us a linear relationship between um, the, free, the, the barrier free energy and the angle under the experimentally relevant conditions. So the elastic energy that's present in these systems is typically much, much so, smaller than the lambda. And so, uh, so this simple idea leads to, um, because it's simple enough, that, <laughs> that my explanation is, is failing. All right. So that's right. It doesn't get too few parameters. So um, because the model is simple enough, so we uh, we could combine um, you know stalling experiments that I mentioned, um, as well as you know uh, some data from uh, ensemble experiment to identify all those parameters that would go in a model like this. And there aren't many, and and it allows us to actually predict. Um, this controlled experiment uh, uh, data. So this is the, these uh, lines are actually uh, without uh, adjustable parameters and, and the symbols are experiments. Now one thing that, that this uh, curve, uh, this figure shows is that um, when we consider, uh, as I mentioned, when we consider the single molecule experiments, we have to take into account all sorts of possible artifacts. For example, time uh, resolution issues that in, in these region of the, of the data, you know, the, the, the switching between on and off, binding and release, is too fast for the experiment to follow. So, uh, you know, during one bin, we could have, uh, you know, binding and release. And so then experiment to that would assi be assigned to either an empty state or a bound state. So when we take into account uh, those effects, as well as uh, the, those, that fluctuation theorem, the idea that, um, you know, we are out of equilibrium. We drive the system out of equilibrium. So we have to be careful how we extract the rate constant from that. So these ideas were used by Sabo and, and Hummer and others. Uh, then uh, we could basically uh, extract the correct 
uh, we extract the rate constant in, in a proper way uh, from the experimental data. So that's the kind of uh, work is involved here, um, being very careful about experimental data. So the, the other part of, of the story uh, involves a different time scale. So we looked at experiments that are uh, much faster uh, in the microsecond uh, time. Um, I think I was, oh yeah. So the, um, this is an example of, of a, uh, such a trajectory. So, you know, this is time and this is a rotation angle and uh, the time resolution here is 10 microseconds between two subsequent points. So the idea was, as I mentioned previously, uh, we get the substeps, uh, but we don't get all, all possible states. So one question was, we could, you know, where should we find those states that are not resolved? Well, in these transitions, in the steps, right? So what we did, we actually took uh, the data and we analyzed thousands of these transitions, these red points, and we looked at the particular observable, which is sort of like a um, discretized velocity. So it, you take one point and the point, the next point, right? And you take the difference, how much the jump was, and divide it by the time step, uh, and, and you get this velocity. So uh, when, when we plot, yeah, the order of slides got messed up. So when we plot those, um, uh, we, could, we could do a histogram, a two-dimensional histogram. This is a rotation angle. This is those angular jumps or discretized velocities. We get uh, sort of like a grouping of, of events. And so those could be identified as states. And this is the theoretical version of it. Yes, so I have a little bit of time left. So um, then we could, uh, we could take, um, we could look at you know, statistics, for example, we could consider sort of the average uh, angular jump as a function of rotation angle. And so we get, when we do that, you know, we, we, we can remove some of the statistical fluctuation, so we get these uh, angle dependent sort of velocity in, in that jump region. And if we just use a three-step model, kinetic model, that was consistent with the previously known uh, behavior, um, you know, we could use a, a simple theory to uh, calculate those velocities, uh, and we get this dashed line here, and that's, again, three states and no adjustable parameters. So what, what's apparent is that we are unable to reproduce the, the experimental data. So we get this big uh, hump here, and the, but the, the data doesn't produce that. Um, so one way to resolve that um, is to assume that there is actually a state there. Uh, so if you think about you know, uh, this short-lived state in between the two states here, uh, the idea would be that the system will, will stop for a very short amount of time here uh, effectively, and you know, that would produce um, this, this lowering of that peak. So the way theory is used here is to is to uh, extract sort of new information from the data. So uh, basically, it's, it's to say that we, we claim that there, the, the explanation is that there is a, a short-lived state, about 12 microseconds, uh, in that transition. And so that state physically is a state after ATP binding. So ATP has bound to one subunit here, uh, but ADP has not been released from, uh, from the other subunit. So we are resolving what a, previously was thought of a one step but two event scenario into two subsequent events. And so the nature of this discovered state, uh, we believe, is a three occupancy state. Um, and so the, the lifetime, this 10, 12 microsecond lifetime, has to do with the, the release of ADP, that the rate of ADP release is like a typical rate, um, which cannot be detected in these experiments. Uh, it's too fast. Um, and so um, I'll leave you with this uh, conclusion side, um, showing you know, what kind of questions uh, we try to answer using this theory. And uh, really, um, it, again, I would like to emphasize uh, that big lesson, um, stay close to um, experiment and um, you'll, be, you'll be safe. So happy birthday, Rudy. Hey, our uh, penultimate speaker for today is uh, 
Maria Elizabeth Michelle Baila, uh, who is a professor emerita at the Technical University of Munich, I think a friend of Rudy for many years, and she'll be telling us about uh, Rudy on a Humboldt Fellowship uh, between photosynthesis and the Kitsteinhorn. To be honest, I wanted to give an after-dinner talk today. And, and because I heard that it was impossible to, uh, to show slides during dinner, I give it here. I give it now. But it will be of this light version. Rudy came to München on a, on a Humboldt Award. And he came to people he knew very well, and these were close friend, friends of him. It was first an entire group from Evanston in, in the 70s uh, accumulated in München, theorists, Ludwig Hofager, Sigurd Fischer, and Ed Schlag. And Ed Schlag hosted him in this, in this Humboldt, and I was in, in this, in this, uh, on this Humboldt Award in, the, in our institute in Garching. I have been originally a postdoc of Heinz Gerischer. I met Rudy, I think I have a, I'm one of, one of the people who know him very long. I met him 65 first time. And this was then 10 years later, the Humboldt was in 76. Uh, Rudy came uh, with his family, with Laura, all the boys. They were so to speak, they had to be housed in München. It was not so easy. And the Schlags were very, uh, very helpful here. And uh, everybody had to go to school and so on. It was such a thing. They came from, from, for winter semester for six months. And um, I had the suspicion all the time that it might be that there was also something else in, in, in the game it was skiing. And this keying has to do with this Hickelsteinhorn, this is the second part. So we talk about, of, about that Rudy is always working, but it's not exactly true. <laughs> when, if, there is, if, he, if there is a possibility to ski, he would stop working. <laughs> and um, Scientifically, I just I make a short remark on, on what we did in that time and what Rudy did, is, uh, did in science during these six, six weeks, six months in München. And you show, and I sh show you we worked at the time, no, it's too much. We worked at that time at the, um, <coughs> on the reaction center. Um, we worked on to make this, why is this going on? Yeah, no? No, no, no. No, it doesn't work. This one. You see here the reaction center at the time. <coughs> it was in the 70s. Uh, we had the uh, isolated reaction center. This was already the success in the 60s. And you see here already the pigment uh, organization as it was later resolved in, in, in much later in 84 uh, in the X-ray structure. But the question and the discussion at the time was how is it working, how, what is the first step? The first step here, as we thought, is the only thing what could be seen in, <coughs> in spectroscopy and with the time resolution at the time was um, a direct transfer from a first donor here to the blue acceptor, which is the fighting. And then from there it goes on transmembrane and you have the energy conversion in the reaction center and in this potential gradient which you create. But uh, the point, we, worked, we ourselves worked on um, recombination of this reaction center, P plus, uh, the P plus up there, moment, here, and this field phyton. A lifetime, it was formed in 10 picoseconds <coughs> and recombined if 
if, if we cut off this channel here, we combine this in, in, in two channels, triplet and, and, and singlet. And this was a hyperfine driven uh, spin flip, which, which led to this special and very striking magnetic field effect. This was our main field at this moment when Rudy came. And uh, the condition for this magnetic field effect to work is that the uh, spin exchange interaction is very, uh, has to be extremely weak. So Rudy did not understand how can it be that the forward electron transfer, the matrix element, is here uh, according to 10 picosecond, or four, five picosecond rate. Uh, so large, while well, this spin exchange rate is so small, spin exchange interaction is so small. This has been solved, this problem, <coughs> by just introducing by paper together with, uh, with my postdoc, um, Rolf Habakon. And, uh, and uh, this implied the solution that there is something in between. It has to go in two steps. At that time, <coughs> it is, there was a discussion exclusively this super exchange mechanism to go from the primary donor to this fit fact. But this, uh, this uh, postulate uh, was confirmed that there is, there is something exactly in between, this bacteriochlorophyll here, uh, and that uh, was confirmed later in the X-ray structure, and also uh, the kinetic, that this is indeed a kinetic intermediate, was confirmed by the polarized femtosecond experiments in the, infra in the near infrared. So this was a nice story. It was published, and uh, we It was published late uh, in 1979, and this was really before all this uh, became so clear as uh, the, the resolution of this primary process. The first day when Rudy arrived, we went with him to a cafe at Schlag and myself, and we were very excited he came, and we had so many problems to discuss with him and so on, but there was no chance. It was only a question when, it was in October or November, where can we go skiing, when can we go skiing, <laughs> and with whom can we go skiing. <laughs> and so we thought, oh, oh, this is this Humboldt of a special, of a special, uh, of a special uh, quality here. Then, uh, we, I was afraid to go skiing with him. Uh, not, he came from the cornfields of Illinois. Yeah? How, 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 how can he go downhill? I, 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 I. <laughs> and therefore, uh, we convinced him that he has to go take ski classes. He and the three boys and Lori went to Paris Cell and took the Christmas vacation off and learned how to ski. When this was over, when this, in, the, in January, Rudy came again to the Mensa. We went to, to, have, to have lunch together, usually in the institute. Uh, and he said, no, now you can go with me. And I was a little bit, I thought, no, yeah, also, he learns it very fast, but perhaps true. He learns it fast. So we, uh, one day, uh, Lori, Rudy and myself, uh, we went to our cottage, not far from this mountain, <coughs> where Lori was waiting while I was going up with Rudy, with the cable car, to that point here. <laughs> uh, we had to go through a tunnel, and what you do not see, there is a relatively flat and very, very easy to go. I thought, I thought beginner, yeah, but he, he can easily do it. He, he, no problem. But uh, I, what I did not think of, of the crevasses, which are right and left, because <laughs> this is a glacier. And uh, so <laughs> the, the, the thing was, it was uh, after this, uh, when we passed the tunnel, there was no return anymore. So we had to go. 
Uh, but I was already a little bit skeptical because he didn't know how to put on the skis. Uh, he had, he, he had, he had new skis, brand new. Also I had old stuff. He had brand new stuff. Uh, even uh, of uh, look, so, so I never forget this because we didn't find anybody who who has such skis. Just bindings. I didn't know how. Finally, we found somebody. And he was wonderfully equipped, everything new, goggles and, and, and gloves, and oh, fabulous. So we started going, but then comes the problem. Uh, one has to turn when you go skiing <laughs> once in a while. And this was a problem. So uh, Woody used the emergency brake and ended in a, in a cloud of powder snow. He uh, lost everything, uh, also everything we had on him, uh, even the poles, everything was gone. We collected it again. And I became a little bit afraid that this was, uh, we, were not, we were by far not down. Uh, that, I, I cannot bring him back to Lori in the evening. Uh, something happens. If he, if he doesn't break like this, then he goes, the, the crevasse is not, is not far. There, and there was no really, one, one, could, one could, but if you go really very fast, I mean, you cannot stop. I mean, what to do? So uh, it ended in, in about, normally you go down this, uh, this easy slope in, in 10, 20 seconds. And, and we managed after, after two hours to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to wear at the bottom of the slope. Of, and you do not see this here. This is in, in the back. This is, uh, so then I thought, I cannot go on because we had to go to that place here. And it looks a little bit steeper than it is, a little bit uh, more difficult, but it was not, it was not, in fact, not difficult. And I knew the route, it was not difficult. And, uh, but now, uh, I managed to get this, it was in winter, uh, and normally this is for the spring, this, uh, this uh, uh, chairlift. Nobody uses it in winter time, everybody goes up and then down. And so I found somebody who managed to organize the, the, the start for us this, and we were able to enter it over there. There was a so-called middle station where you could enter, and Odi was a little bit disappointed that we didn't go on uh, the way, but he was already wet, and it, it was not the way to go on. And I was, I was at the end with my nerves. <laughs> Then um, we, we are sitting here after we come we come from behind and I marked red where, where we were this is Rudy and me. As the only passengers in this lift, there was nothing, nobody coming up, nobody going down. It was only maneuvered for us because I didn't want to bring him down in a sledge or something. <laughs> also, then uh, the then the worst happened. Um, you see the, the, this green line here. Um, a, a kindergarten from uh, Caprun. This, uh, from, this is a, the, the base village of this Kitschernhorn. A kindergarten from Caprun uh, was zooming down <laughs> and, and going really fast and even without poles. Nothing. They just whooped as it came, one after the other. And they were not older than five, six. So this was, Rudy was really shocked seeing this and would have liked to do also this because he was always going fast and stopping with a, in, in such a, 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 yeah, what you would call in German, Potzelbaum. Yeah, it was absolutely, absolutely dangerous. And so uh, Rudy was following it. He came from here and he followed it like this. Zoom by, zoom by. And, and, and became a little bit depressive. And the end was some sort of mumbling. And this is the next. I hope I get now the, the right. At least he no more chemistry. 
das, was ich so lustig habe. Das war, I, I thought I, I died. <lacht> ja, but, but, this is, a, this is not a very heroic story about skiing, but you should, then he left Illinois, and he came to Pasadena. And look, what happened? He became a really strong skier. I saw him later in Switzerland, and really, pfuh, fast and, and fabulous. And his passion took him, uh, was, was so, it, it was dominating everything, even, and that's the science in this thing, which you all know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this was it. This was it. <laughs> Now is the time for the man himself. Don't need an introduction, Rudy. So just come over here. Um, with his ski poles. <laughs> I will say, Rudy, I'm not going to give you the five minute sign. You can talk as long as you like. And uh, let's, uh, let's give, it, give it up for Rudy. Could you advance the slide for me when I say next slide? Then I'm ready to do it. You want to use this one or this one? Well, thank you very much. It's certainly been, oh, you got it. Well, an experiment. <laughs> uh, it certainly is a pleasure to be here and hear all these compliments, deserved or undeserved. Um, but it's um, exciting to see how people develop, how the students and postdocs developed. And um, of course, there's so much fun. And um, as most of you teach know, in, in teaching courses that you enjoy teaching and trying to convey the essence and uh, strip it of things that uh, are just si you know, side issues. Um, and perhaps even create a point of view, so on. Anyways, uh, for me, um, and I'm sure for so many other people in the audience, uh, teaching has been a, a wonderful way of actually of learning. Uh, uh, I remember a math, uh, a famous math place, uh, a Koran Math Institute that I spent a couple of years at. Uh, I was uh, uh, the... Uh, Professors involved, there were top mathematicians, wanted to teach. And I, I was a bit surprised because, you know, well, you know. Uh, and, <laughs> and I asked them why. And they said, well, that's a way of learning the subject. And it's absolutely true, you know, if it's a subject you're trying to learn. Well, anyways, um, uh, in Canada, where I grew up, there was there were no theoreticians in chemistry at that time. This is in the 1940s. And so those of us who were interested in chemistry did experiments. That's what was available, and that's what we did. Um, and it took me several years uh, there as a doctoral student and, a student, and later on as a postdoctoral at the National Research Council of Canada in Ottawa, to realize that, well, I wasn't very good at experiments, you know. I like in the uh, at the NRC, I was very impetuous, and um, all of the work was glass apparatus and with a lot of mercury in there, Tepler pumps, and so on. And I kept on breaking these things in this impetuous. You know, you can't make a lot of progress that way. Um, anyways, we did write a couple of papers, but uh, then I realized, well, I'd enjoyed math so much. In, um, in, that I, t I took for chemistry extra courses, that uh, why not try theoretical chemistry and so on? And of course, the chances that uh, somebody might take on somebody who knew no theoretical chemistry as a postdoc uh, were pretty slim. But of the six people that I wrote to in the U.S., um, Oscar Rice uh, said that uh, 
all right, if I get an Office of Naval Research grant, uh, if he gets one, uh, I can come. And he got one, and I came. And it was just a, a <coughs> wonderful experience. It, it was the difference between night and day. I realized that experiment was really not my fort, although I used to like making things. Um, but with theory, <laughs> you could do almost anything, learn so much in such a short space of time. Anyways, it was a, a real turning point, and um, uh, that was where uh, he introduced to me uh, what was called RK theory, the theory of the 1920s on unimolecular reactions, and um, uh, he indicated some calculations he made, and uh, so then I started working on that problem, and um, uh, I... Um, what to do? Well, I read about every paper you can imagine, some of which were in German, so it took a little time, um, the, uh, on, related to unimolecular reactions. And um, then I, I, I did something which I realized perhaps permeates uh, most of the work or all of the work that I do, which is uh, connecting dots. Um, in this case, the dots were the different kinds of papers on unimolecular reactions. And uh, as I looked at them, uh, I, uh, what I didn't like, what didn't seem good, I threw out and retained the other and eventually uh, built up something that later became known as RKM theory. In the first paper that I wrote, this one with Oscar Rice, um, we, uh, the result was in the form of an infinite series and so on. But then when I got to Brooklyn Poly and the next year I realized that I, uh, there's a way of interchanging summation integration and uh, getting a uh, actually doing the sum. So you get a finite simple expression. Um, and then later I found a way of uh, avoiding uh, even having to go through that operation. Um, so... Uh, that, that is, in a way, a kind of example of, uh, uh, of putting a bunch of dots together, pieces of information together, in this case, works of others, and putting some ideas and so on. Uh, and then I uh, wondered, well, what to do next? And there were very few experiments at that time in unimolecular reactions. There had been a lot previously, but a lot of them turned out to be wrong. Other mechanisms took place that weren't realized and so on. Um, but I wondered what to do next, and I fiddled around with one thing or another. Um, uh, but then a student asked me a question on the course in equilibrium statistical mechanics that I was teaching, whether a theory that we were describing uh, could be applied to polyelectrolytes and high, high ionic strengths, and I thought, yes, it could. So I, I learned a lot about uh, polyelectrolytes and learned the electrostatics uh, in a rather deep way. I looked at every book I could get in the library, and some books are better than others in the physical insight. Um, and then uh, eventually, uh, a couple of years later, this electron transfer problem came up. Uh, Bill Libby, who later won the Nobel Prize for his work on radiocarbon dating, had uh, uh, explained why some electron transfer reactions were fast and others were slow in terms of the Frank Condon principle. And when I saw that paper, just spending some time in the library, I was very, very excited. I mean, I'd never seen the Frank Condon principle applied to the chemical reaction before. And uh, then as I thought a little bit more and looking at it, I thought, well, there's something wrong about this. Uh, yeah, apply electron, uh, apply Frank Condon. There's something wrong, and I realized what was wrong without going into details uh, was that actually the formulation he had violated the law of conservation of energy. Well, in Canada, you know, that's not permitted. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, I found out a way of, of, of introducing the Frank Condon principle and avoiding that violation by allowing for changes to occur before the electron transfer so that the tra it could then transfer and satisfy. Um, so uh, I think that work uh, was, was another example 
of putting uh, dots together. The individual dots being, uh, in this case, a, a detailed, really basic knowledge of electrostatics, of molecular systems, and uh, then, of course, a little knowledge of the Frank Condon principle and a little knowledge of the fluctuation ideas. So I, I think that uh, uh, was an example. Um, and then I th th thought, uh, you know, about later work that I've done. Um, and uh, in each case, uh, like, for example, the work um, that's uh, in the, um, let me see, the, end, uh, the mass independent isotope effect. That involves the theory of unilateral reactions, but it also involves uh, the question of regularity and versus chaos of the intramolecular motions um, that go into um, uh, learning about the fundamental basis of things like RCAM and when it is valid and when it isn't valid. And um, so I um, made use of those ideas um, and uh, uh, some knowledge of semi-classical theory, theory that Bill Miller has done so so many contributions on, um, and uh, was able to put together then a theory for this um, uh, this uh, mass independent isotope effect. And more recently, uh, Buring at, um, at Berkeley did experiments with various uh, gases and uh, showed that um, uh, that the pressure effect on this um, mass independent isotope effect and uh, making it not mass independent um, occurred. It, it could occur at far lower pressures than, say, rate of recombination of um, ozone uh, formation, uh, uh, O atoms and oxygen to form ozone. And um, so, while that wasn't a prediction, once that experiment came out, it was uh, certainly a confirmation of theory, or more precisely a confirmation of that theory, because it may be if there are other theories, they should sub be subjected to satisfying what was really a very dramatic and important fact. Um, and in the case of uh, another problem that came up, <coughs> number six on the list there, uh, was the uh, work of Barry Sharpless in studying uh, um, addition reactions, organic reactions uh, in uh, emulsions and uh, finding, um, when you do some calculations, uh, enormous increases of rates. So that's one dot. And then I recall that uh, Ron Shen at Berkeley had done some frequency generation experiments and studied the behavior of OH groups at uh, the surface. They can't all hydrogen bond with each other, the geometry won't permit it. And so you had these OH groups sticking out so that if they attracted the tran transition state more than they attracted the reactants, you'd get a big catalytic effect. Made some calculations, Jung, um, and uh, you know, it, it agreed with that. Um, anyways, uh, uh, I don't know if this is a general way of proceeding, the way most of us proceed, but I, I think that, uh, at least in my case, that putting bits of pieces together that are that are somewhat unrelated, uh, that sometimes you can re construct something. You know, for example, in the electron transfer, um, I didn't expect that that equation would, uh, or some aspect of that equation, would successfully treat atom transfers and group transfers. But yet, in uh, both experiments and uh, in uh, computations, one sees that uh, results are obtained which are in agreement with the predictions of that, even though it started off in electron transfers that have nothing to do with the other. Um, and it even happens, I believe, in this uh, work that um, Shander was describing on, um, uh, on the F1 ATPase, and one of the steps is ATP going into uh, one cleft in the enzyme while an ADP comes out of the other. 
Well, you know, the analogy of that is, is just simply an atom transfer reaction, or a group transfer reaction, where uh, uh, in this case, it's something going in, something binding, and something going out. And as long as they're co coordinated like that, it can accelerate the rate by a factor, I think, calculate a, a million or so. So there are certain results that were derived for simpler systems that with a little imagination, uh, you might assume or, or later try to show in computations uh, applied to more complicated systems. You know, it's just like in uh, mathematics where uh, if you consider Euclid Euclidean geometry and some of the theorems like related to the diagonals and the sides and so on. And if you go then to a more general space, Hilbert space, the same kind of rule applies to the functions and so on. So, uh, and I think there's some of that uh, in, in theoretical chemistry and <coughs> observation. Um, now, whether one can uh, operate that way for in, in the future, uh, whether one can find the simplicities that, that's needed or some key assumption, I don't know. Um, but of course, it's a fervent hope since I've enjoyed it so much that the future with all the wonderful computations that are done and that we could never have done in, in our time, um, uh, with all of that, that there may be some combination somehow, some insight somehow, <coughs> so that the old fashioned way of developing equations um, and predictions that way uh, won't go completely by the wayside. Mm. Well, anyways, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and, of course, to see many people that I haven't seen for a long time and to uh, emphasize once again how fortunate those of us who have been teaching and have been doing research are uh, to have wonderful collaborators. Of course, it's true that if the collaborators are very good, you can work that way. If they're not very good, well, you just can't work that way, I guess. But uh, uh, anyways, thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for organizing this uh, symposium. I, uh, oh, one thing I guess I should add. Uh, my be Professor Michael Byerly was talking about skiing. What you don't know is that she was an expert skier and uh, in ski racing, what have you, and even at one time was buried in an, ambulance, uh, an avalanche in which she fully recovered. So she knew where, where she talked and what she said about my skiing was certainly true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudy. Um, and so that brings to a close the symposium part of today's celebration.